All right, welcome to Retired Japan. Today I'm talking with Ray Saito, who is a very interesting guy. I've been following him for a year or two now, mainly through his Konnichi Value, uh, which is a Substack and a YouTube channel that I'm aware of. There might be more. We'll hear from Ray in a minute.、Um, but he writes about investing in Japan and kind of big picture stories about Japan. Really interesting stuff, really well written.、Uh, and I've really enjoyed following his stuff. And today I get to talk to him. So, welcome to Retire Japan, Ray Saito. Nice to see you today. And、uh, yeah, I'm excited about this conversation. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Cool. So, just for anyone who hasn't come across you before, could you give us a quick self introduction, kind of quick background on you and you know, how you came to be here in Japan writing about stocks? First, to start with, I'm half Japanese and half Swedish. And so I got a true mix of cultures living in both countries, basically half and half. And, That's quite、uh, the combination. I Japan... <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's very different in cultures, I'd say. So I got a you know, schizophrenic mix. <laughs> I came to Japan last time, the time I live here now, around、uh, five years ago. So I got a good you know, one year before COVID. And、um, this time, I came here really to work in finance and work a bit in investing. And with my work being what it is, I realized that talking to people outside of Japan, this is just a huge missed opportunity here, I feel like. Like people have an idea of Japan, and I work here and I just see something completely different. And I've also been very interested in finance forever, basically. My education is in economics. So that made me start Konichi Value. Basically, this part. Website, part YouTube channel, where I try to both make people that are interested in finance, but their eyes haven't yet opened to Japan. And also, people who, people you deal with probably every day, people who are very interested in money and saving, but they just don't like have that push to make it happen. And I'm really trying to appeal to both those people with, you know, an accessible language, more humor, and some education sprinkled around my website and YouTube channel. So that's basically what I do, and all of it about Japan. Yeah. So I've been, yeah, I'm really impressed with how you, you structure your, your posts. There's lots of research in there.、Uh, I always learn a lot from them, and your YouTube videos are really good. So <laughs> do you have any kind of、uh, background in video and so on? I mean, I have some background.、Um, I'm using、uh, more complicated tools by the day, but Uh, so far, I realized that sticking to the basics, doing simple editing, being able to produce some quantity, and not spending all your days doing tiny video <laughs> edits is the way to go. Yeah, I think so. Like consistency and, and putting something out you know, every, every month, every week, I think, is maybe more important than the quality at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that pottery thing where you know, the, the professor gives the class an assignment to make a really good pot, and half the class. Uh, just makes hundreds and hundreds of pots, and the other half spend the whole time making one pot. Oh,、uh, I haven't heard、uh, about this. The students that made loads of pots made better pots than the guys that really focused on one quality one because they were getting the reps in. So、oh, I think YouTube's、oh. similar. You know, you got to get your reps in, and, and you'll, you'll get better over time that way. Yeah, I'm reluctantly saying I'm that camp. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So you work in finance then? Yeah, I work、uh, in technology and finance. So I work for a financial company, mostly doing their technology、uh, infrastructure. So I see、wow. the worst of both worlds. <laughs> and that obviously influences your, your hobby and your, your side work, which is researching stocks and, and writing about stocks and finance and so on. Yeah. I mean, they say, you know, you should keep hobbies outside of work. But... And it is cool because when your hobby, Connects with your work, you can kind of get the insights, you know, and become more agile in, in what you're seeing at work and seeing what's wrong and what's right in a way I wouldn't do if I just did my job to get money. Right. Yeah. It's more fun as well, isn't it? So as long as you take、yeah. an interest in, in things. So could you tell us a little bit more about Konnichi Value then?、Uh, you know, what it is you do, how it started,、uh, and how you see it going forward? So it started、uh, basically, as I said in my introduction, that I was very shocked. About just what people think about Japan, even inside Japan, what people have ideas about the Japanese stock market or Japanese housing. And I realized that there's a huge discrepancy with the former idea of what Japan used to be 
and what it is today. And that discrepancy, that anger about that discrepancy grew. And I realized during COVID, you know, when everybody was inside, that this is a perfect opportunity to see if people are actually interested in knowing that there's a discrepancy and knowing if they want to know the truth. And so that's how I started Kunichi Value. And it already from the beginning, it became kind of a quirky project. So, you know, I have the Irasteya behind me, as you can see, which is these Japanese free pictures you can take <laughs> and anybody can use without any license. And it's kind of like Japan is kind of weirdly quirky, right? So it, in one side, it's very serious, like with finance, etc. It's extremely gray and dull and things has to be done a certain way with everything. But the other side is this quirkiness and mascots and, and people really trying to be inviting in whatever they're doing. And so I'm trying to combine those pieces because I think that is the biggest hurdle in the world for finance is that it's either for people who are extremely savvy or it's people who don't know anything and just let an advisor do everything and i think that that's not the average person is somewhere in between right and that's the person i'm really trying to adhere to that's why the language is quite you know i do like thorough analysis i do things that anybody could use in real ways with numbers and graphs etc but at the same time i do it with a more inviting language and inviting pictures and more quirky and fun ways of expressing myself. Yeah, I, I find that. So I'm not a particularly numbers kind of guy. And, and I always find your posts very easy to follow along to. Would you say most of your readers are outside Japan then, as opposed to in Japan? So I've actually uh, just connected all my tools to Google Analytics. So I have the good raw data now, right? And it's a 50-50. So... 50% are in Japan, mostly in Tokyo. And I assume most of them are uh, English native. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a mix of people who lived abroad probably and also foreigners. And then the other 50% are divided in four big countries. So it's the US is the biggest one. And then Canada and Singapore are close seconds. And then okay. India is there too. So it's kind of like, I expected the US, but the other countries, I'm a little bit surprised, but it makes so much sense when you think about it longer. So it's, it's nice to have that kind of audience as well, particularly for, I don't know, monetization purposes. Yeah, definitely. Because the, the overseas audiences tend to be worth more than the domestic Japanese audience, at least in my experience. Uh, and we are, of that course, 90 odd percent in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> at yeah. Japan. So you write a lot about stocks, choosing, or you do kind of analyses of stocks. Um, so how do you go about thinking about choosing stocks? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm that's in my name. So as you can see, it's Konichi Value, right? So Konichiwa is the first Konichi, and then Value is Value Investing. And so I'm a, a firm believer. Uh, in value investing. And that's, you know, it's basically, I think the best way to explain it is like value investors, I think, see stocks more like people buying houses, let's say. So if you buy a house, you know, you would need to check everything. You want to check the foundation. You want to check if there's any mold. You want to check if it's earthquake proof. And that's value investing. We invest not because of a certain time or because it's the stocks on sale we invest because we think it's a really good stock where the foundations are clear. And so that's under my investment strategy that I believe that, you know, it's not about timing. It's about finding the stocks and just keeping them as long as you would keep a house if you can. Okay, so you're going for the Warren Buffett kind of excellent stocks for a good price rather than good stocks for a cheap price. Exactly. Do you also invest in indices or do you only have individual stocks in your portfolio? I do both. I think everybody should do both. And uh, I definitely invest in the Nikkei 225, the, you know, the Japanese index and the topics, also a Japanese index and a substantial amount in the American S&P 500 or SPY. Nice. So you, you do that kind of America and Japan rather than the whole world. Yeah. I Sweden is uh, <laughs> as a... Half Swedish person, I think the Swedish market is super interesting too. Something I might not talk about too much today, but uh, yeah, a substantial amount in specific Swedish stocks are definitely part of my portfolio. Do you have any advice? Because you're talking about people who maybe don't have enough information to, to take action and so on. Do you have any kind of specific advice for someone who's just starting out? Yeah, so this, this as I said, this is like what I'm, I'm really trying to fulfill, right? And I think it's, it's very... I found it very hard uh, to 
bridge the gap, right? Of making people that say, you know, oh, I, I want to buy stocks and to, to actually make them interested and to do the research. But I found the easiest way is, you know, like you have to put your money where your mouth is. So I think, first of all, as I think you promote too, it, it's great to invest monthly in an index. And, and that's great for most people who genuinely don't want to look at balance sheet or, or want to know that much about companies. I, for them, an index is great because over a long enough period of time, the markets are always going up. And so if you invest in an index, you really don't have to think more than to put money aside every month. And once you get to that habit, it can become interesting to start looking at individual stocks. Completely agree. So this is so basically index investing is the kind of gateway drug for stock investing or stock picking. Exactly. And it's like to build a habit, right? Because I, I mean, I have a sister who's... Um, She's not very interested in stocks, right? And in the beginning, when she said, you know, the market was probably doing really well, and she said, I, I really want to buy stocks, right? I want to get rich out of stocks, right? She probably watched some TikTok video or something where somebody got rich of stocks or Bitcoin or whatever. And, you know, in the beginning, I was like, okay, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to check. And she would pretend to listen. But then a month or two months later, you know, there was, it was just uh, pennies in like the stock account I created for her. And so that made me really reconsider how to reach out to people. And I think first thing is to get the habit. So if you just start with an index fund in your country or the S&P 500, which is the base, you just do that monthly for a couple of months, see how it feels, you know, maybe log into your account a couple of times. Once you get that habit, I truly think that it's so pivotal to start looking at at least one stock in your portfolio. If you, for example, just love Toyota, for whatever reason, right? If you just put a thousand yen in there for fun, because you believe, you have a strong belief that Toyota will beat Tesla in electric cars in 10 years or five years, right? And so if you just put some money, just a symbolic amount of money in there, and then you will naturally start looking at the news differently. Whenever you see something about Toyota, you will instantly click on it. You will start reading what's happening. And there is no better feeling in the world, I'd say, than if you were right. So let's say in five years, it's a huge, you know, BBC article, whatever, that Toyota is selling more electric cars than Tesla. And you just be like, damn, I'm so right. And then the second thing would be, I should have invested more, right? <laughs> but that like that kick, that adrenaline kick, I think that's enough to make anyone get an interest in stock and like start digging deeper to find, you know, things they love. Because stocks are really your own part of a company. That's really important to understand. Okay, so talking about stocks and owning them, um, why do you like Nintendo so much? Because this this keeps coming <laughs> up on Konnichi Value and you, you, you're you all in on Nintendo. So can yeah. you explain that a bit more? I mean, who doesn't like Nintendo, right? Uh, <laughs> but I think, I mean, first of all, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing company. Like, that's how I start all my research is trying to find just good companies, right? Before I look at the numbers and if they're undervalued or whatever, I just want to know if the company's good. And Nintendo's one of those, you know, it's like Nike or Apple. Like it just has this like following that's crazy. And, and the management has been so consistently good. And they've done, you know, they've created some of the most interesting uh, IPs and products in the world. And so that's, the first reason, right? Also, growing up with them helps, of course. Uh, <laughs> my favorite game is still Zelda Ocarina of Time on the Nintendo 64. Then, secondly, I think it is weird when you look at the numbers of Nintendo because it's very cheap compared to, like, Sony or Microsoft or Apple, companies that could be their competitor, right? And it's some of the reasons, I think, is because most of the people who invest in the Japanese market are finance people. So they look at, you know, uh, more hard numbers, like Nintendo is kind of there. They're reaching, like, uh, uh, saturation on the Nintendo Switch, etc. And and they're just doing their predictions, you know. Oh, this it, Nintendo's growing XYZ, and that's why we should invest this much money. Or they just missed out completely. But I really see like Nintendo is going through a shift. And this is my thesis. This is why I love them so much. Where the management have finally realized that Super Mario or Zelda or Peach or whatever, they are stronger than many Disney characters. And kids have actually been shown to know more about Super Mario 
than they know about uh, Snow White or you know Lion King or something, right? And the management have finally realized this, and they're pushing out you know Nintendo's IPs to movies, to merchandise, to other consoles, just to have like the reach that these IPs truly can reach. And then you see Disney on the other hand. Uh, doing absolutely horribly with their new movies and you know people are talking about the woke mob or whatever I, i'm not that into that but it's just interesting to see how not to utilize your ips right and nintendo's doing the opposite they're doing it just right with the new super mario movie the new zelda game the new pikmin game that are all blowing up like crazy and so i see my thesis as nintendo actually being able to slowly overthrow disney in many of disney's own areas and at the same time growing revenue and growing audiences in a way that's much bigger than even today. That's quite a compelling argument. <laughs> <laughs> so you're basically, you basically, you think that the, the IP was maybe undervalued until now and, and they, they're going to be able to realize the true value of the future. Yeah. I mean, just uh, one simple number that I think everyone can grasp is that even today when Nintendo has actually gone up very much with the Japanese stock market, Disney is still 31 times higher in valuation compared to their earnings than Nintendo. And to me, it's, it's just insane that Disney, that's been failing now for, what is it, five years? Their profits are five times more valuable than Nintendo's. That doesn't make sense to me. And I think that's where I'm seeing the discrepancy and seeing that I can maybe utilize the leverage to earn a lot of money. Nice. But again, this is a long-term play, right? So Nintendo might go down. I don't know, 20, 30% this year, you know, with the economy and stuff. But if you long, look long enough in the horizon, I think Nintendo is a very sure bet. So in terms of uh, resources that people might be able to access, obviously Konichi Value is a good resource, but do you have any other kind of recommendations in terms of books or social media accounts or websites or YouTube and so on? Well, first off, just... For everyone who's trying to find like a super tool to find stocks or anything, uh, you know, if you're already there, you probably know what to use. But first, just use Google Finance and Yahoo Finance. They're free and they're great. They have 90% of the numbers you need. And then for if you want to know more about, you know, finance philosophy, etc. Uh, I'd say again, like I've, I've recommended books in the past and I feel like the people who read them are people who don't need to read them. Because <laughs> it, it's a big undertaking, right? Like if I tell you, like, read this 400-page book, maybe you'll do it. But if you're not that interested, you probably stop after 10 pages. So I think, like, the way to really get into finance is YouTube. And uh, there I have some really good recommendations. Oh, okay. So, like, um, this, I might be a bit biased, but The Swedish Investor is a great YouTube channel. Um, he talks about he basically makes stories out of value investing stories of people who are fighting against wall street or who are fighting against you know the big the big bad banks or something and how they can win because they're using value investing it's very compelling very easy to understand so that's is it in thing. swedish it's in english oh <laughs> good 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 <laughs> so yeah even you can listen to it if you want to awesome and then uh, Plain Bagel, maybe you heard about him. He's a big finance YouTuber. And he just does like a guy on a mic with a camera and just talks about what's happening in the world. But he talks about it like without the, you know, like the TikTok hype, like this is how you earn a million dollars or whatever. He just like tells what's happening and, you know, doesn't bring in Illuminati as soon as something crazy happens. And he's just like right. a sound <laughs> voice. <laughs> In the world of finance, which is so rare, to be honest. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, mention Japanalysis and Asianometry too. Cool. Uh, you've probably heard about them. They're both like Asia YouTuber, Japanalysis to YouTube videos on Japan. Just super interesting stuff. I just like to ask you about your personal finances, because obviously, retired Japan, we talk about how people are, you know, organizing their their financial life so that they can be safe and and enjoy things. But how how do you go about doing that? What's your kind oh. of strategy from here on forward financially? I've always had the idea of being able to um, not work for a year whenever I want to. And I think that's the, the first goal I reached. So after studies, I made very sure I have enough money to live a year 
without doing anything. And still, I'm. it's not like I just had that money lying around. I was making it work by investing in stocks and stuff. But I think like when you get that freedom, it's very easy to start planning the rest of your life. And so that's number one. And that's something I would recommend to everyone. Like one year of income in your bank account, in stocks, whatever, something that, you know, not crazy risky, not all in a cryptocurrency that's completely new, (laughs) but, you know, you can still take risks when you're younger, right? And that money is really for if you want to try something new, start a business, whatever, you just have that money so that you can do it. And to have that work becomes so much easier, right? Because I know I can quit tomorrow if I want to, and I'll be fine. I have more than a year to find a new job. And I think that has made my life so much easier and freer. And me being able to tell, you know, I want to have a vacation next week to my boss without feeling like, oh my God, I might lose my job. Mm. That's that's number one. That's just the the hygiene. And after that, I'm doing like probably most Japanese people. I'm investing in the Nisa account. So I'm trying to max that out. And uh, I'm also, they're going to renew the Nisa now, right? So I can put around 3 million yen. Of yes, that's free. very nice. Yeah, so that's something I definitely am going to do. Um, and I think that's just such a good benchmark for people like, if you can save 3 million yen a year, that is a really good start to having first financial freedom today, but also, you know, being able to retire maybe before you're 80 years old, you know? Yeah, I think like you said, like just getting that first amount saved up, that's going to set you on a path where it's going to be easy for you to, in, you know, save and invest multiples of that. So, right? so you, you just, focus on investing every month, I guess? Yeah, definitely. Like when the you know money comes to my account, it's automatically withdrawn. And uh, that's, I mean, that's the only way to make sure that you're saving every month. <laughs> Do you have an idea of your saving rate? It's around uh, 25%, I'd say. Yeah, 25%, 30%. That's very decent. I mean, so... I want to get to 50 but this is good when you're living in Tokyo. <laughs> um, so what are your views on the FIRE movement? I mean, I think it's really good. Like FIRE movements are all about value too because they're long-term investors, right? So most FIRE people are not talking about uh, <laughs> like pink slip stocks or whatever. I think it's it's a bit risky. I've always dreamt of having the kind of money that the fire movement does so I can retire right now, just if I wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. But it's tough because like once, if you say you set a hard goal, like a hard fire goal, especially if you don't do fat fire, which is, I think, a $10 million or something crazy. And I think, I mean, I think the, the philosophy is extremely good and a lot of people are doing it, are doing it right. But it's a lot of this like, I think it's like the American grind mindset kind of comes into it. So it's like you work really hard, you sacrifice everything in your life, like you rent out 90% of your apartment, whatever, and you just make like a 70% savings or more every month and you don't really live until you retire, right? And then yeah. when you retire, you kind of like get off the grid or whatever. And for <clears> people <throat> who want to do that, I think that's great, but that's also very risky, right? Because then what if hyperinflation happens or what if something really bad happens and you've just been out of the job market for too long that can be Mm, a bit risky definitely so i'm more of like the slow fire movement you know where you like you aim for it and maybe you miss a bit but you kind of like you have the mark in your head i think it's the retire early bit that is sometimes problematic when it people get obsessed with it yeah because obviously financial independence is a net positive, right? There's nothing bad about that. It's when you're rushing to retire early, you know, and you're, you're sacrificing the present for the future. I, I can see that not being great. You, you know, you see these Reddit posts by people who are like, oh, I'm only saving 80%, you know, like, and I, I broke <laughs> up with my girlfriend because I couldn't afford to have a girlfriend and, you know, stuff like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh, chill out a bit, dude, you know? It would be better to focus on having, you know, like uh, a job that you enjoy kind of thing. Right. Where where do you see the future of Japan? Because obviously we've got these demographic problems. We've got the weak yen at the moment. Uh, there, there seems to be a, a bunch of different crises that are converging. Do you, do you see the future of Japan as a, as a, a rosy future or, or are we in the doom and gloom camp? I am neither. 
Uh, I think I'm very much in between. But I'm definitely not in the doom and gloom camp. Like, I mean, if, if doom and gloom happens, it probably will happen all around the world, you know, with uh, everything that's going on. But I think that people kind of forget that Japan's, you know, if you look at Japan, right, it's for 30 years, not much has happened. Things have been very stable. And <clears throat> even though that's false, that narrative is false to some extent, I think that's also true. And the true part of it makes Japan an extremely stable country. So, you know, you have these things that are in other countries would be horrendous, like uh, national debt that's 240% of GDP. You have a rapidly aging population. But I think the benefit there is the Japanese people are kind of going along with it. Like there's no riots. There's no, you know, uh, retired people striking in mass because their pensions are getting lowered. They're just kind of accepting that this is the reality. And I think that alone makes Japan so stable. And where if they just get a little bit more push in innovation and, and trying to change society... I think people will be on board as a, like a necessary evil, you know, because this country is not a country that, you know, like, for example, France, I like to take that as an example, right? Where you trying to do these changes that are necessary, that every scientist and politician can see will have detrimental consequences in 10 or 15 years. And as soon as they just try to go 10% there, everybody protests, get shut down, the governor or whatever gets voted out, and then they have to start the process all over again. Mm. And Japan is way slower in moving than France, but they also make those changes happen. And so I think that that kind of shows that when you have a stable country like this, you know, investments will thrive in Japan, I think. And with Asia growing, I think Japan will naturally grow with it. And mm. so, yes, it, it, will, it will not be, you know, the richest country in the world. Again, ever again, I think. But it is really impressive that Japan is still the world's third richest country. It's richer than India, a country with 1.4 billion people, right? So uh, it's just like people forget that Japan is still such a powerhouse. And I think it's going to continue to be that way. Awesome. So you're quite optimistic. Can you see yourself leaving Japan in the future? Uh, and if so, why might that be? I can. I think there are issues here that I, as a Swedish person or half Swedish, uh, some issues I'm still struggling a bit with. I Childcare in Japan is good. It's good for American standards and in some ways Asian standards too. But like compared to many European countries, I think Japan still lags behind a lot. So I don't have children now, but if I do, I depending on how hard it is, I might consider moving. And then secondly, I think this is on all our minds, but there will likely be a massive earthquake in Tokyo in the coming years. We don't know when. It could happen tomorrow. It could be in the next hundred years. But if that happens and if the impacts are horrendous and God forbid, you know, I hopefully survive. But that's something that I think would make anyone consider leaving, including me. No political fears. Uh, so it's really interesting, right? Because Japan is, I mean, it is a democracy, but they've had the same party for <laughs> the better half of the century. It's it's not, I don't, I'm not a particular fan of the Liberal Democrats, the party that basically runs Japan. But they're stable and they do what's necessary. To a certain extent, that's better than... 80% of the world. <laughs> so I'm relatively happy to be here in, in, in a political sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar. So I, I'm planning to stay. I could see us leaving. Like, we, for example, we, we, we thought about leaving with the Fukushima thing. Yeah. Until we saw the situation, and and then, uh, and I can see you know a future kind of disaster maybe or some kind of political change where it becomes you know unfriendly. But I think there's a very low probability. Uh, and the other one's climate change, right? Obviously, this summer has been unpleasant, uh, and it's yeah. likely to to get more unpleasant in the future. So it's kind of where Definitely. where that ends up, I guess. So for me, it's but always then, like where are you going to leave? You know, where ah, are you yes. going to go? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah trying to find the the ideal climate somewhere like maybe new zealand like <laughs> that's yeah that's what the billionaires do so <laughs> can't be too bad have you got any final kind of advice for our listeners in terms of learning about investing starting investing i i think i just want to end with saying you know that uh to anyone who's listening anyone who's you know on the fence on investing and and feel like you know as soon as they start searching for companies they just get overwhelmed and they give up I think, you know, start small. Rome wasn't built in a day, right? But then, like, if you just start 
and look at the facts and the simple numbers, you can really build a foundation of the house that will become your nest egg. And, you know, it, investments grow over time. Like almost all good investments grow over time. And so if you just start small, sooner or later, you will have a massive house that's all yours. And that's just because of compounding interest and just how the stock markets work. You can truly build something great without much effort. Yeah, I think that's that's the message, isn't it? Just get started, try and learn as much as possible. And you'll be surprised how much you can do in a couple of decades. Is oh, what yes. I found. So I started 15 years ago. And, and yeah, I'm amazed at the progress. Awesome. It was great talking to you, Ray. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone definitely check out Konnichi Value, both on Substack and on YouTube.